according to the cloud. So yeah, uh, uh, WordPress uh, to Jekyll, uh, take two. But so there's some pros and cons to uh, running WordPress. Like I said, great ecosystem. It's WYSIWYG. You can easily edit from any web page. And you can even schedule future posts to automatically appear in the future. So it looks like you're actually engaged and working hard and like posting at a regular cadence where you really aren't. You just queued up a whole bunch of crap and just ran for it. And it's also, uh, since it, it's all run off of PHP, if you want to do something uh, dynamic, you have the PHP in full uh, Apache uh, force there to, to help you out. The, the cons, since it is world famous, it's also a uh, and dynamic execution. It is a massive attack surface. You're always having to make sure that it's up to date and it's a never ending battle. Plus, if you want to do anything that isn't the WordPress way of doing things, you're going to fight tooth and nail. And then also, just as a purist, it's not really HTML. It uh, generates a uh, web code that looks kind of slightly better than Microsoft Word. So really, I, I suffered through, but I kind of Stockholmed into loving it, I guess, at this point. So where am I in my uh, journey of moving away from it? Uh, so this machine that we're looking at right now uh, is actually a CentOS 8 box. So over the weekend, I just upgraded to Rocky 8 and it was mostly painless. I did have a little bit of RPM hell that I had to remove a couple of the things that I've installed for getting uh, K3S working on it. Uh, and it didn't like the upgrade there. Uh, Run C was uh, messed up. So I had to delete a few things and reinstall it. It worked fine. Uh, I'm using Podman instead of Docker because I figured, well, that's the, the Red Hat way. And uh, that, because of the way that I was doing things where I was mounting a local folder in and running rootless Docker, I got stuck in SE Linux hell. And so a little bit more on that later, but uh, this is the command I ended up having to use to run it. And then I'm also working through my somewhat 11 some odd years of old posts and converting them from WordPress to Markdown. Uh, there's also a bunch of dead links. And there, so there is a tool that you can use to port it over, but I, I'm doing it by hand partially because I'm a, a sadist and partially because I want to go through and number one, make sure that I clean up any cringeworthy posts that uh, as time has changed through the years uh, might not be the best thing to have out on the internet anymore, as well as uh, trying to clean up dead links uh, especially since Flickr stopped uh, hosting everything for all time. Uh, a bunch of those old uh, free images that were uh, uh, community commons listed uh, are no more. So uh, there's a bunch of dead pictures and stuff. So yay. The, the biggest thing about the internet is don't trust the internet. It won't last forever. So this is basically the, the work in progress here, a screenshot of it. And as you can see, it looks fairly close to what it looked like before. Uh, and there, there's still a little bit of customization that I need to do on it, but it it's all static. And there you can see the uh, first post, of course, uh, new blog, who dis. And where am I working it towards? Of course, like I said, I'm using uh, Jekyll to do static HTML. I'm going to be moving it uh, onto GitLab pages, so I won't have to have a VM running at all. It will just all be generated HTML and static. Uh, building via GitLab uh, CICD. And then, of course, uh, I'll have it uh, backed by Cloudflare, but that's just mostly because I already have the domain set up there and it just works better. 
but I mean, since I get ones of visitors, unless someone starts posting my stuff onto uh, uh, Hacker News or Slashdot or something like that, it, it's not going to be a big problem. So, yeah, of course, with everything, there's a good part and bad part. It's going to be serverless, like I said. It's version controlled now, so if uh, the database ends up going down, that, that's okay. And it's definitely a lot less of a blast radius, but it's also now serverless. There's no WYSIWYG, it's all marked down. And it's also compiled. You, you don't have PHP to do funny things if you want to do something special. So if you want to do that, you'll still have to spin up your own uh, little VM, but it will have a far less uh, impact if someone owns it. So let's talk a little bit about ja Jekyll. Uh, the first thing about it is that it's designed to be simple. There's no worrying about MySQL, uh, no con comment uh, moderation or anything like that because my uh, WordPress site had where you could make comments. Now, of course, the problem is I'd have to, if I ever wanted to, I, I'd have to wade through like millions of try my Cialis uh, stuff or free drugs and girls.com or stuff like that. So usually about once a year, I'd go through and declare uh, bankruptcy, even if you had the, the like plugins to help try and cut those down, they'd still get through and it was a just nasty battle. So I never really had a comment that I liked, but that goes with the ones of people. So uh, it's also statically generated, like I said, Markdown and liquid uh, templating. So what is Markdown? It is basically a text file that's unobtrusive. You can read it as is, and really it's sort of the, the easy button to text. Uh, as you can see, oh, this is definitely not playing nice here. But as you can see, there's a whole website around how to mark down and get started. But going back to my presentation here, basically uh, one hash space, space is H1, two hashes is H2. You can do all sorts of things like links and uh, just bolding and all, all the stuff. It's just an easy, quick, dirty way of doing uh, uh, context-based text. And basically the idea is you take Markdown, you run it through an app, you get HTML, and then you can view that. And uh, it's everything from email to uh, web pages to notes. Uh, they, there's uh, just a whole plethora of apps even things like uh, GitLab and GitHub use it for uh, the like README files and stuff like that. There's even a website that you can go to that will let you work through your mar markdown code to figure out what it looks like. Onto the liquid templating engine, what is this? Shopify were the guys who originally made it. And it's basically just a simple markup engine that makes beautiful results is what they're, they're trying to go for. It uh, isn't evaluating any code on the, the server side of things. And basically they, their whole premise is don't trust the users. Designed to be stateless, and it also was supposed to generate uh, HTML that would be valid for both web and email. The other big thing about Jekyll is it's very blog conscious. So, let's see here if I can make this a little bit bigger. So, in this, uh, this is basically a markdown example of a blog post. And basically their whole idea is that you have something called the front matter, which has some various va uh, variables, like it's a post, and this is what the title should be, this is when it was published, and that's what the background image is. There, there's some other ones that are on the website uh, that you can use depending on what template you have. And then everything else that you put after that is the content. And uh, 
As you can see, it's just text and it magically gets turned into HTML. Uh, if you put a file in uh, the directory structure that doesn't have that front matter to it, it just gets treated as a static file. So like say if you drop a JPEG file in, it just will magically happen and be a JPEG instead. And so this turns into basically that. And uh, if you want to do stuff like uh, if there's some HTML, like for example, here's a post where I wanted to just straight up copy the stuff that was generated by WordPress, you just drop your HTML in and it works. And it just basically passes through. So you can have your cake and eat it too, really, in the, the end of things. So how do you install it? Well, if you want to go the hard way, you have to have Ruby, Ruby Gems, uh, Make and GCC, and then basically you just say gem install Jekyll Bundler. And then you just run your, to create up a new page, you go Jekyll new my, and the name of whatever you're making. CD into that, and then you can do uh, Jekyll serve. Will actually uh, serve up a local static uh, uh, web server that will, as you drop more files into the folder, it watches for changes and recompile it. But you know what? It sucks installing uh, Ruby and getting the right version and things change. And you, who wants to keep that all up? So it gets even easier with containers. In this example, you could use Docker if you were that included. Uh, but since this is being run on a uh, Red Hat-like machine, I figured might as well use Podman. So basically, the command structure here is Podman. Just think I'm using Docker here instead run, remove the container when it's done, run it interactively. Dash V is mount the current working directory, which is where my files are into slash web. Uh, since since uh, by default, this is running rootless and inside the container, uh, you land running root, uh, SE Linux freaks out and locks you out of trying to do anything, of being able to CD into that folder. So you have to tell it, you know what, no, it's okay. Uh, network host makes it uh, use network low, uh, stack so that you can actually see it from your web browser and then run the, the uh, container Jekyll uh, and uh, run bash in there just because I, I wanted to have an interactive ter terminal. It's just that easy. So as an aside, what the heck is Podman? Uh, it's a daemonless uh, container for running OCI containers, or a, a daemonless container engine for running OCI containers in Linux. They think like uh, Docker, except for without having that thing running as root all the time that uh, creates a security hole. Uh, and basically, you can use it as a drop-in replacement for Docker, but better. So as an example here, wait, this is, there we go. So here you can see I've executed the uh, Podman uh, and I'm in the container now. And let's go ahead and create a new uh, website called Demo. I run the bundle, Bundler runs and does its stuff. We change directories into there. And then next up, I want to uh, take a look at some of these files and the structure, which we'll get to here in a little bit since we actually are on the machine and it works. Uh, skip ahead a little bit here. So, uh, here, I, I, we're looking at one of the markdown files, and now I'm going to run the command to actually compile the uh, HTML. 
and it's just that easy. And now it has the, the folder underscore site with all the static HTML that we care about. You can also run the command clean and it will be just like make clean where it deletes those uh, uh, files that were generated. And if are you, you screw running, things up- Are you running these commands in Firefox? So uh, ASCII IEMA uh, is a screen recorder that makes YouTube-like uh, uh, recordings of uh, uh, your your uh, shell, basically. Uh, okay. So uh, the, the this is the the solution to the well. My my presentation absolutely just uh, uh, crashed on me, and uh, I now embarrass myself trying to uh, root around and make things work. If you record it ahead of time, life is so much easier. Okay. But uh, so the, the other one thing to, to call out here is if you screw up your config files and you don't know what the heck's going on and it's just failing, you can ask the doctor and uh, sort of like uh, the therapist in uh, certain text editors, uh, it will tell you what's wrong and what you need to do. For example, by default, we don't have URL set and that might cause some problems. And then of course, since it was all in a container uh, that we ported it through, when I exit, now I don't still have Ruby hanging like a boat anchor around my neck uh, when I, I don't want it anymore. Because I mean, who really wants Ruby on your machine? So then the, the other uh, command to call out here is if you run uh, Jekyll serve, uh, you can actually uh, go ahead and uh, have a dynamic version of your page that recompiles as you change files. And since we're doing that uh, double dash network host, it makes sure that your uh, it's actually playing on your local network stack. So it actually uh, will be viewable in the browser. So if we go this, uh, of course, the, the first problem is since we're going into a fresh Docker container, we have to run bundle install to install some missing gems, which the big thing is it just takes a second to install here. And then when you run uh, Jekyll serve, you can see it uh, generates up your files. And then if you go to localhost uh, 4000, it uh, just works. So, and we'll dive into the, the actual editing here in a couple minutes. Now, of course, by default, everything looks ugly. There is a bunch of free themes out there and also themes if you want to pay for them, or you can create your own too. In my case, I'm using Clean Blog. It's a little bit crummy in the fact that uh, if you, you actually have to check it out of GitHub and uh, compile it yourself if you want to have more than just the uh, uh, default uh, uh, posts about contact and home as your uh, hamburger menu up top. But you know, it works and it, it was easy and it looks pretty much like the WordPress uh, theme that I was using before. So now that you've got it compiled, let's move it to the internet because HTML files on your local disk, well, I mean, that, that would see slightly more viewers uh, if I posted on the internet, but probably not much more for me. Uh, there's really two good, easy options that are uh, free. GitHub has uh, pages. They were the first one. There are limitations to it. You can have one gigabyte of total size. They have a soft 100 gig uh, bandwidth cap, and they limit you to 10 builds per hour. Now, of course, for a site like mine, that's not going to be a huge problem, but, you know, there, there's also uh, GitLab, and they have pages as well, named similarly, because, of course, why not? And uh, their limitations are just their standard 10 gigabyte uh, sized uh, re repository limit. They have uh, no official bandwidth limit. Apparently, they'll reach out and talk to you about uh, maybe doing things differently if you, it gets too crazy. 
and uh, there are no uh, build limits if you're using your own runner. Otherwise, you're limited to the number of minutes in your uh, package. Like say for free, you have like 300 minutes a month or something of build time. So of course, since my blog is, uh, there's that whole quote from Stein, John Steinbeck about how Americans are just temporarily embarrassed uh, millionaires, my blog's gonna hit it big someday. So uh, GitLab see the route I'm gonna take just because it, it doesn't have nearly as many limitations. So right now, just to deploy just a static site here, uh, you can see I'm just, uh, this is a GitLab CI script. We'll have uh, in a later meeting, just exactly how to customize these things down. Right now, the big thing is in my repo, I have a folder named public, and it's just a hello world HTML file. And basically all you have to do is just tag it as a public artifact and then it, it gets hosted if you uh, config in uh, the GitLab uh, pages site. And then you can even set uh, so that blog.denner.co is uh, hosted as a GitLab page. Fairly simple. It has uh, certificate or it has the uh, um, uh, your, your standard Git uh, a uh, HTTPS uh, certificate and force it. If you go to HTTP, you'll end up at HTTPS, you know, just like normal magic. Well, if you want to go ahead and compile your Jekyll site, the, this is uh, basically the path you take is that you just CD into this folder because that's the way that I have it currently set up and checked in. You run bundled install like we did before, Jekyll build. And right now it's dumping that underscore site uh, to inside that folder. I just move it out to the public, still tag it as the artifact and that's it. And it's just that simple. It just runs for a few seconds or a few minutes, depending on how big your site is. And that's really all there is to it. Um, there's a quick so, question, by the way, from the chat. It yes. Looks like Lee was asking, how is Jekyll for navigation in indices? So uh, you can do tagging. Uh, otherwise, let's go ahead and pull open. Uh, so let's see here, where am I here? So if I go to SRC, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Well, that's okay. Zoom is, working. Okay. Well, anyway, though, here, so I can find where I'm at. There we go. Okay. So if I go into blog here, and so let's go ahead and scroll back to my Podman uh, commands here. Well, just where I had it in here. Sorry about this. Yeah, uh, Control R. You run a bash. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, looks like I. Oh. I want to stay here and I want to go back to my uh, PowerPoint and I'll just copy and paste it. Because I wanted to grab my uh, uh, Podman command so that I don't have to uh, type it all out. Here we go. The curses of uh, being on a remote desktop here. Okay, so there we go to run and we go CD web. 
And so then uh, the uh, the command we want to run next is So bundle exec Jekyll serve. And you see I have to run bundle install again because new container, uh, new everything. So running bundle Jekyll serve. Okay. Oh, it helps if I actually, okay, it should be, I just run Jekyll server will work. Oh, for Pete's sake. Wasn't it God God God's blood? Uh, it helps if you actually spell Jekyll right. So now if we go to local host here. Four thousand. Here we go. So you were asking about uh, navigating and discoverability. You can go to all posts here and view uh, what I have here. Uh, it, it is a templating engine. So I mean, you can uh, get it so that it will uh, post uh, any sort of tags or stuff like that. But uh, that, that's pretty much where we're at. The, this particular template's a fairly stupid uh, one, so it's uh, fairly simple. But you can go to like about, and uh, the, of course there's your post. I want to see you with that mask on. <laughs> and uh, contact me. So I mean, it, it's basically just as much effort as you want to put into it. But uh, there, there is some customizations and some uh, basic scripting that you can put into it. Uh, if we look at the, the uh, behind it here, basically your uh, structure is uh, going to be that gets automatically generated. You have this underscore post that contain all of your posts. And basically the format that they want you to use is uh, date and then uh, name.md or HTML. Uh, and then like say if you have a uh, image that ends up being uh, just uh, statically uh, brought through as uh, just assets there and uh, Otherwise, like that about page, there you can see where we're grabbing mask X from image. And if you put in markdown, that's how you get to uh, an HTML link there. Or uh, basically like 404 ends up being the you can't be found, etc. So I mean, it's fairly simple. By default, uh, the other big thing to call out here is this config.yaml. And uh, that's where uh, you have like setting your title, email, uh, descriptions, your social media accounts, what theme you're using, stuff like that. 
Otherwise, that, that's pretty much it. It's fairly stupid, fairly simple. I I wanted to ask you. Um, WordPress normally has a, a hard coded URLs. Um, what does what happens with Jekyll? Does it un, un hard code them or what? Uh, so yes. Code? So uh, you can set the HTML uh, for the, the base path. And then if you look here in the posts, uh, for example, if we go to uh, this post here, you can see that it, the, the hard-coded path ends up being year, month, day, and then the name of, so it was like new blog.md is what the file name was. And so th that's the format it goes by by default. But you can in that uh, header that you set there, you can also set what uh, you want the the actual path to be rendered as for hard coding it. Okay, I I probably didn't explain the question in in enough detail. Uh, usually, there's a site URL which starts out HTTP HTTPS backslash blah blah blah, and all of this is part of your. Every URL that's generated has this hard coded yep. within it. And um, I see here you have localhost. So obviously, you're yes, uh, because it's running in development mode. Uh, so uh, you, you can set that in the uh, this uh, oh, uh, config.yaml. One of the uh, the settings that you set there is uh, your uh, base URL. So like say, uh, if you want it to be slash blog, you set that and then like uh, the URL here is where you put HTTP example.com or something like that. And then that's what ends up being put at the front of each of your uh, URLs. If I, I think is what you were asking for. Yes, yes, exactly. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I didn't do a very good job of explaining that one. Andy, I have a question. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so I, I ran uh, Octopress for a number of years, which is, I think, maybe built on top of Jekyll. It's very, very similar to this. And the problem I ran into was with those Ruby gems, which are like not, like you're checking in some stuff, but like some of it is Git, you know, is, is along with Git, but those Ruby gems are not. And like, I, you know, I kind of know the bare minimum of Ruby, but I don't understand the, um, you know, the, you know, the sort of care and feeding of a, of a Ruby installation. And I don't know where those gems were going. The gems at some point, I think it was maybe a mix of things that I had downloaded versus things that came with Ubuntu and it, yeah, you know, we just got out of sync and I had no idea how to fix it and it just stopped working. And yep. um, and I had no idea how to get it to start working again. And it was just like one of the gems, like the one that formats source code just stopped working on me and I have no idea what to do it. And it's it's incredibly frustrating, right? And like, does this, I, I, does running it in Podman like avoid that problem or? So uh, the, the two things that are going uh, for you there is uh, by running it in Podman, you've got a working version of known good of uh, Jekyll. Uh, the, the, uh, the actual container we're grabbing is uh, actually uh, from the, the makers of uh, Jekyll. So. Right. Um. Uh, and then also on top of that, uh, the, the other, so we're, we're grabbing from the, the Jekyll group. So that's a known good image that they, they blessed. And then on top of it in the Ruby, uh, gem file here, that basically is the, the, uh, uh prerequisites that you're asking it to install. Uh, we also went through and pinned the version. So like say Jekyll is pinned to version 4.2.0 or 4.20, I, I guess, yay. Uh, and so by hard uh, pinning those, you 
that, that will make it so if there's a new one that comes along, you're, you're not going, number one, you won't benefit from it unless you come through here and change it to like say four, three, if it existed. Yeah. Um, or, I, I guess that's a, I mean, that's kind of a related problem is that, and, and it's really Jekyll's not unique in this is that you, I think at least with Octopress that I, you start by downloading, you know, you check it out of Git and it's all fine, but then like, how do you do maintenance on that going forward? Like if, it, if someone finds a security hole in that version of Jekyll and you have to go to 4.3 or 5, right? Maybe by the time you discover that 4.3 is obsolete and you have to go to 5 or 6 and you know, you've got what your, your code, your, your repository, your, the, your, your blog is a mix of you know, your static, you know, your markdown files, plus these gems that you don't really know what's going on because they're Ruby and you don't know Ruby any better than I do. And you've got all this Jekyll code, you know, which now has maybe been updated because of the security hole and like that whole, and maybe it breaks some other things when you do that and you don't know how to fix it. And like that whole part about having this whole mix of things makes yeah, me so the 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 biggest benefit I can see here is since it's less than WordPress. Yeah, the, you you yeah, still yeah, have that same problem with WordPress, right? But well, yeah, the the, 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 big... the Jekyll stuff is never live. Like it's only used to translate this into static HTML. Yeah, yeah, I totally, yeah, I understand that. Um, so if you can't okay, trust, so maybe a better maybe a better example is there's some new feature in Jekyll five that you want to take advantage of. Um, you know, maybe. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't even know what they could have had. Maybe they, maybe they had support for, um, you know, building, you know, you know, chatting, or maybe they add support for comments, right? That you didn't have before. And you want to get that, you want to get that ability back because you liked it. Like you're, you want to chat with that guy from Indonesia that's sitting your site. Um, but then so, any kind of updates, just, it, you know, I think it's just inherently problematic. And it, like, I lived with this for a while too. And the problem was eventually it broke on me and I didn't know how to, un how to unbreak it. So I think one of the big benefits we have here is the, the fact that these post files are so very uh, stupid simple that uh, basically all, all they are is just uh, date title, uh, and that it's the post layout and then markdown. Markdown hasn't changed in years. Worst yeah, case, that's, that's, that's part that's gonna that's gonna run into the problem. The problem is gonna be all the plumbing. That that's yep. that so is what can break. Yep. So the the idea is that very worst case, if we have to declare bankruptcy and say my my Jekyll site is just totally hosed. I, I can check out a new Jekyll uh, with the, the command to create a new site, declare bankruptcy, just move my uh, posts into the new one, and Bob's your uncle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a, 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 you know, an additional problem with Octopress is that they, the guy stopped maintaining it after a while. So like even, like, even yeah. the stuff that was up on his site, if you tried to download it, no longer worked like it was expecting older versions of gems that weren't around anymore um it was yeah. all, it was all and, that. and i think that's the, the benefit with jekyll is that it has the backing a of a lot of people yeah and so because of that i mean uh, basically gitlab and github both have put their their blessing uh hey this is how you do stuff as well as like the most of the world is uh, sort of centered around this. So there, I, I have a lot better feeling for this one. But of course, with the, the provision that if I like it, it means that it has about six months until it stops being popular. Mm -hmm. That's usually the way that everything happens with for me. Did yep. you consider Hugo at all? Well, I, you know, uh, Hugo, I, can I? Yeah, you can. Why don't you you answer? Then I'll I'll answer if you looked at it. No, go go ahead. You you probably have a better, gonna, well thought out well, answer. I was gonna, well, I mean, I I don't know that I do, but um, that was one of the static site building tools that that people were pointing me to when I when my site like stopped working maybe like last year at this point. Um, 
I think the problem, the problem with Hugo and the problem with a lot of them is that I, is Hugo, I think Hugo is, it's node based. Go. Is that true? A go based, I believe. Go based, but it, it's still, it, it, it was all the documentation I found and the like and the, the things all were built around someone. They were designed for someone that is very familiar with like modern web like web development pipelines. And so there was just a lot of stuff there that I just had no like like the the go part of it was fine. I couldn't get the you know, the, the templates that I found to work or compile with anything else. And um, I think there still was some JavaScript in there and maybe there were some Java JavaScript packages I was supposed to be installing or something. I don't, you know, it was a while ago that I looked at it, but there was, a, there were some, maybe there was something else that was node-based and um, like, I just had the hardest time getting any of them. Like even, I could, I could barely even get a whole world working, let alone an entire blog um, up, so. I mean, that was that was my that was my experience, and yeah, my, my, about, yeah, with Jack, these Jekyll things is that all you're doing is changing some like text config files, which was the nice part of it. You didn't have to understand, you know, you didn't really have to go in and muck around with CSS or you know download any kind of JavaScript packages for the build or anything else because you know it was all kind of straightforward. So that that's really all I, I need to say about it. Um, Yep. Uh, so yeah, my my experience with looking briefly into Hugo is that it was a little bit harder to uh, uh, play with, and uh, with Jekyll you can if you if you care about going into the weeds of playing with the HTML and the JavaScript and all that stuff to create your own template, you can totally do that all day long if you want to. It probably will take you all day long, just because, like Walt, I, I'm not the the best web person around. I can muddle my way through it, but it's a pain, and uh, that, that's why I liked uh, this in the fact that all the batteries came included uh, to change the template. All I did is just tweak that one uh, YAML uh, file, and so I changed the. I added in uh, the gem to uh, run the, the uh, clean uh, blog theme. And then I edited the, uh, where is it here? Uh, config.yaml to say that it should use the, the clean blog. And that, that's basically all I had to do to get it running the, this other theme. Yeah, but, what, but what, if you, what if you need to change the menu on the top or you want to, remove one of the pages. That's where I got stumped in, in Hugo. Uh, yeah, so if you want to do that, uh, it has instructions on the, sorry here. Uh, so on the uh, theme page here, if we go to the, the GitHub, uh, so this is the, the actual, uh, uh, the source code for the 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 theme here, yeah, and right. basically, if you uh... okay, so uh, scroll scroll up a bit, Andrew. Yep. Uh, so this is yeah. Oh. It, it, it scroll down. No, there was some. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. This is a uh, remote desktop, so uh, I, I'm playing catch up here as it runs. But uh, so basically, to set it up, you just do new site, and then you uh, config. That's the the sort of base easy route that uh, I took here. But if you want to actually get okay, that's that's what I was missing. Index HTML about contact posts. Okay, that was a structure that I couldn't figure out in Hugo. Yeah, yeah, in, in yep. Octopress, it was it was easy. I think I added like to the default theme, I added um, you know one or two extra things, and it was really a matter. Maybe it was listed. It may have been listed on the on the website. Maybe it wasn't, but it was a matter of like finding where the um, the, the menu that was currently there, and it was a text file or, or links or something like that, and it was. It was quite straightforward to 
to do it. It wasn't it wasn't difficult at all. Okay. Yep. Which uh, the the if you want to actually uh, go into the weeds here uh, to uh, edit things, you you have to download or clone the, this repository, and then you go about uh, editing the the actual template itself. And then uh, basically just follow their directions here. And in theory, it should work fine. Uh, okay. I, I haven't gone that, that far into the weeds. Like, like I said, I, I'm still stuck at the porting uh, years of old blog posts and cleaning those up stage. So. Yeah, so the my, idea my was one advantage is my my years of blog posts are formatted in exactly the style that Jekyll wants. Um, so they should, I should just be able to put them to the new directory and be good to go um, in theory, but who knows. Yeah, well, and the fact that you're also already using uh, templating based uh, blogging uh, to begin with. Mm -hmm. So you, you've already got your how to host uh, static sites all worked out and everything's already in markdown. So you're, you're good to go. Oh yeah. Well, I do with the sort of Jekyll way of doing things, with, with at least something that was similar to it. Um, you know, doing it with Hugo or some of the other ones was, you know, if I'm, you know, if the if first step is going into something and, and, you know, installing stuff out of JSON, out of JavaScript repositories, that's probably, it's probably not for me. Well, I actually the layout that Andrew showed for posts is exactly what Hugo used. You know, the layout for a post. They're all marked down. They've all probably got gets more complicated and that's where they diverge. Yeah, the, the other benefit, I don't know, you might want to look into if you're wanting to go with Hugo, uh, one of the things you could do is look to see, I'm, I know they have a Docker container for Hugo as well, that would solve you for, save you from the having to install all those crappy things on your uh, one machine. Uh, actually, Hugo was a one line install. It was a package. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, no, the container in the issue, the, the problem is it was a, I still haven't figured out how to set the menus on top to that, those sections in the pages and then create a sub page for posts and stuff like that. It just was not very intuitive. But then again, I haven't touched it for a long time. So. Yeah. So with this, uh, if it catches up here. Uh, so uh, if you look at, like, say, the, the includes uh, folder here, you've got, like, the, the nav bar. And this is where you can edit and add in. Uh, so you, here's where you have the home, about, posts, contacts. Oh, okay. It would be real easy to cargo cult in a couple yeah. more links if you wanted to. Okay, that, well, that's the second level. And the Hugo, all that... Uh layout for that's in the config.yaml but uh yeah you it looks like they may have to go back in there and tune some of that but then it gets muddy as to well do you change the version and the theme or do you but you, you have to put that copy of your file in the base site so it overrides the one in the theme so yep uh, I, and I, I, in this case uh basically they they have the instructions of what to do uh you basically just clone the site into your or clone this theme into your your actual file, uh folder structure and then it uses it instead of the, the like uh base theme that uh is out on the internet that it downloads instead yeah, yeah. okay thanks no problem. And of course, this part of it is somewhat theoretical. I, I haven't done this part yet. So but, uh, any other questions or thoughts? So you mentioned that you're having problems with SE Linux with rootless. Did you ever uh, add the uh, Z? option to your mounts, which turns on the auto labeling? So uh, the, the issue with the this, uh, so dash Z, you mean in uh, Podman or? No, uh, here, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, so you do, 
His mention was with when you were talking about Podman. Yes. Uh, if you wanted to uh, mount it, read right into the container, oh. you pass the Z okay, off. Okay, got you. Okay, yeah, I, I understand completely. Uh, for the most part, usually my my mode of operation is just to brute force turn off uh, SE Linux because I hate it with fiery passion, but uh, it, it's one of those things where I figured, hey, you know, I, I'm going to try playing by the rules. And then it caught me by surprise uh, while I was trying to get this together. So it was like, okay, quick Google and search how, how to fix this. But I, I'm definitely learning uh, how to do this whole rootless thing. That, that's the other thing with normally running Docker is since you always run as root as a daemon, uh, it, it sort of cures a lot of problems. So, like, but from a security standpoint, you're still running in the root context. It just, uh, you know, gets clever with namespaces to fake that. Yep, and uh, so that, that's both a good and a bad thing. It can be a really confusing thing too if uh, you're trying to run uh, in the container as not root because Podman's default behavior on rootless is to map your uh, fake, the fake UUIDs that it makes for the namespace uh, in, to root inside of the container. Uh, so if you're running as uh, not root inside the container, like say GitLab, you know, runs as a different UID, I believe. Um, yep. You have to tell it not to do that UI, that namespace ID mapping or else you'll get very mysterious uh, permission denied errors on a lot of things. Yeah, I I found that rootless, uh, both rootless Docker and uh, rootless Podman works best when you're not mounting uh, things from outside of the the world into your container. Yep. Like but, I was doing a really dumb, or not really dumb, but like, will you cut it out, dog? Um, Okay, now the dog's got it. The dog's got to get in the chat now. It's a rule. I mean, I don't make the rules, but unfortunately, my camera is not working. But um, so what I've pasted there is like my Podman uh, invocation to create a container for an influx DB uh, instance. And since I'm running yeah. it as a different UID there, I have to pass in the user namespace keep ID argument, or else it just does not work. Yeah, I I try my darndest to uh, not uh, mount things if I can help it. But uh, then, then again, here, a lot of the stuff I've been doing here lately have been uh, more uh, Kubernetes-based, uh, so uh, persistent volumes and uh, the such. Yeah. because I can get a lot bigger machines uh, that way compared to the local one that uh, has uh, Docker running on it. One of the other useful that I find things for Podman is uh, if you pull up the man page for Podman generate, uh, yeah. here, you can go ahead and uh, screen share if you'd like. Yeah, let me try that, see if it'll work. Camera not working, but screen share would. Yeah. Is that going through? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So just look back to like one and a half handed. Yeah, that that's nice. Uh it is uh it makes life a lot easier there. Uh, yeah. Um, I was also interested in reading, uh, I, I read something about how you can uh, use SysD to, uh, SystemD to schedule your Podman executions for like- Yeah. Um, does he want this recorded? 
Yeah, we can go it's, ahead and uh, stop this recording. This is not sensitive. <laughs> okay. 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 But my agents apparently stopped working. Yeah, so you can see here, uh, the invocation for that is just like Podman generate, and then you tell it what thing you're uh, generating for, and then yes. the container that it needs to dump for, and then that spits out a uh, system D unit with all of the crap done for you. So all you need to do is run like daemon reload. Will you stop eating my sock? <laughs> And uh, oh, then, you know, run start or whatever. And it just, you know, it takes care of all of it. There's some extra switches that you can specify at like container creation time that control like the uh, timeouts for the start and stop there. But it makes orchestrating them just with system D pretty easy. Hey, Andrew, you can stop recording now if you want. Ow. Okay, here, one second, sorry. And...